Welcome to Coffee House. Yes, this one is short, but we are doing it in two parts. There was just so much stuff in here that I thought that we should discuss. Josh Hawley is a United States Senator for the state of Missouri. I watched a part of the discussion that he had with Jordan Peterson. They talked about uh, various things in that discussion. But he seemed distinctly political, as opposed to philosophical. So... Jordan would open a discussion with something that was kind of complex and philosophical and had a lot of parts to it, and then Holly would give a response that was kind of a sanitary political position. So I wasn't sure how insightful his work would be when it came to these kinds of political books, which are often empty anyway, but I was very pleasantly surprised. Holly kind of identifies a through line from the robber barons to big tech monopolies, and he offers very useful responses that we can all get behind going forward. So as always, we're going to talk about the contents of this book, and then we're going to do a brief analysis, and then we're going to try to wrap into a big picture understanding of the world and things that we've learned so far. <laughs> So he opens up and he's talking about how on January 6th, he was being persecuted or attacked simply for the fact of he wasn't at the Capitol, he didn't participate in any things that happened. He was there to go through the constitutional process. And this is something that is constantly forgotten, and deliberately so, is that there is a constitutional process for challenging votes that you believe were fraudulent. And it was used by Democrats in 2017 and used by Republicans in 2021. But he was going through the constitutional process to try to question some of the votes in some of the states and was broadly persecuted for it by the left and the media, etc. So one of the things that he brings up as a concern is the power of these new monopolies in big tech, because they are kinds of filters now of the information that gets out to people. So the first chapter, The Return of Monopolies, and he references monopolies like uh, Facebook and, and how they function much like the robber barons of yore. And he talks about Theodore Roosevelt, who we'll do a, a whole chapter on soon here. But the point is that the big tech new robber barons use an addiction business model. The point is to make their customers addicted to the product so they will return to it over and over again. And even though you end up with worse psychological outcomes, you have censorship on it that can affect elections, such as with the New York Post story on Hunter Biden and the connections to Joe Biden. And he references a study discussing how the actions of big tech can sway 15 million votes in major elections. And so there are a lot of negative consequences of having these kinds of monopolies in the United States and the world at large. So the robber barons, who were they? they these were the great titans of industry from history. The U.S. Steels, the General Electric's railroads, J.P. Morgan in particular was a participant in those. And there's a discussion of the railroads. So before the Civil War, the biggest employer was the plantation. Then you had the railroads come about, and this opened up tremendous opportunities for the robber barons to gain a foothold in all sorts of industries. You had Vanderbilt who switched to railroads in, 18, in the 1840s. By the 1880s, the railroad owners were the richest men in America because there became this, you know, inter, this very complex interplay of railroads and other industries. All these things were developed with the helping hands of government, and in these days you would have these robber barons who would direct entire state legislatures and just get laws passed that were to their benefit. It had become a faction, the exact kind of faction that was warned about by the founders. In 1872, there was this news report that the robber barons and the owners of these railroads had given shares to government officials so they could get certain favors when it came to legislation. Thirteen congressmen were involved, and it was the biggest bribery scandal in American history. So at this time, we have the shift from kind of local business people and local businesses to these massive corporations that are now trying to take over the world. And they participate in practices for the diminution or death of their competition. So then you had this kind of ideal situation for these kinds of people, wherein the new monopolies brought bulging profits without the threat of sharp competition. The next chapter, The Last Republican, talks about Theodore Roosevelt and what Theodore Roosevelt was trying to do to try to stem this tide. He believed that there was a great threat in the concentration of wealth. The big concentrations of wealth and power were toxic, and that wealth must be earned by service to his or her fellows. 
Holly references that the Romans celebrated, you know, this kind of freedom, the specific kind of freedom that you're able to direct your own destiny. You must have a say in the governance of your own nation, and it's something that Roosevelt believed as well. So there were efforts at this time now for to regulate corporations, the large corporations, and there was a, a shift in the burden, such as where Theodore Roosevelt said that the government could declare a monopoly first, and then it must be rebutted by the corporation. But while he was president, Congress rejected his antitrust efforts, and then he was defeated in 1912. And Wilson, who was elected, accepted that monopoly was inevitable, and he was the first prominent corporate liberal. And this is what we see now to be just kind of the default, is the corporate liberal that happens to be aligned with all the things that major tech companies that are the modern monopolies want. The triumph of corporate liberalism. So Barons, the Rob Barons wanted a new ideology. They wanted an ideology that supported the position that we would have a cadre of elites who were going to manage the economy. Rather than the people being involved in that management, it was elites that would do it. So he separated, Wilson separated liberty from the idea of self-rule. It's not that every common man has a say, it's that you have a liberty in what you want to do, but the elites are the ones who are going to be controlling all the important questions. So Wilson got in the way of a number of anti-monopoly efforts and acted to corporatize government itself. He spoke openly of regulated competition, but he accepted as inevitable and progressive the idea of monopolies. He had this lifelong belief in the perfectibility of human nature, and this goes back to actually what Thomas Sowell was talking about when we read his book, A Conflict of Visions, where he talked about unconstrained versus constrained visions and how that changes your approach to what you're going to do when it comes to humans. But so Wilson is an unconstrained, has an unconstrained vision where he believes that humans are perfectible. So the more concentration of power and wealth is just a boon to the ability to be able to perfect humans. A Federal Reserve Bank was developed and we have the income tax and you have this long shift from taxation of capital to taxation of labor. Then there's some talk of kind of the globalist ideations of many of the tech monopolists. So Zuckerberg openly spoke of a global community, and a lot of the tech giants and the leaders of the tech companies prize transnational ties, and they'll say that openly. The companies are built around prodigious data collection, that's the whole point, and they treated people as data to be mined. It assaulted their agency and imposed on their independence because it's trying to manipulate you into this addictive personality so that you'll be on their platforms. But they want you online as much as possible. That's where they get their data and that's what they use to sell more to advertisers. Data mining, of course, used to be a pejorative, but now it's something that is sought after. Google, they use their Chromebooks that they would give freely to teachers and students. This is a big initiative that they used. But they use them to spy on the teachers and students. They would mine their data. It was just another source of data. And then when there would be resistance to this, when Google would be attacked, they would adjust the kind of data mining in some of their products, but keep it in others. But broadly, overall, they would just continue to mine all this data. Facebook, at one time, they realized that they had more data on more individuals than any company on Earth, you know, early in their development. And the whole point was that the more personalized the data collection could be, the more time you could get somebody to spend online, and that means more data for you, and that means more ads that you can sell. And the weird thing is that big tech actually employs far fewer people than other advancements, you know, major technological advancements and, and corporate advancements in history. So something like car production, when that came along, it meant that a lot more people were going to get hired and a lot more jobs would come to local areas. But when it comes to big tech, you could do a hell of a lot more with far f fewer employees. So it's not this giant boon to the employment prospects of Americans because we have these massive billion and trillion dollar tech companies uh, that are, are functioning in the United States. The next chapter is called Anti-Social Media. So there was something that was found, that Americans were suddenly having trouble concentrating in the 2010s. And there was something that happened soon before that that was likely a major cause. The average American adult checks their phone every four minutes. And it was found that it taxed attention and reduced problem-solving ability even when it wasn't in use. So even when you weren't, weren't using your phone, in the other times, your attention was taxed and your problem-solving was less your ability to solve problems was less. 
It adversely affected cognitive ability, and you had soaring rates of depression after this time. You had a spike in youth suicide. And there's a general assault on common feeling and sentiment. Now, as I'm going through this, I'm I'm just kind of listing these things out. But Holly goes through and he cites different studies that are related to these things. These aren't just things that he's stating as an observation or something like that. He cites studies that are related to these. I didn't read the studies themselves. Of course, if we were going piece by piece through this book. And that's something that we might do with a few books as we go, as we reread some of them. We'll just go through and actually go to the sources that they reference and review them. But in this case, like I said, Holly's not just saying these things. You know, he's referencing studies that that speak to each one of these points. Modern children and teens could only manage six minutes of studying before reaching for their phone. According to one study, they were much more likely to be sleep deprived. In general, they're getting less sleep on average. And a lot of this is driven by fear, and it's it's a very particular kind of fear. It's the fear of missing out. We have an innate drive to compare ourselves to others, and this is something that's being hacked by uh, big tech companies. We have this passion for recognition and an innate need for social affirmation. So what happens, and most people have considered this at some point, that this is likely what's happening, is that when you see image upon image of perfect people having just this amazing life, it ends up affecting you in negative ways because you're automatically comparing yourselves to what's going on with these. Like one of the big developments in this was when Facebook added a like button and that had a dramatic effect on people's psychological well-being when they would use Facebook. So people, just in general, people with a greater fear who report a greater fear of missing out on something, they're much more likely to spend time on social media. And then we have rates of lower self-esteem after this. And we have an increase. It used to be prior to, you know, this big development of social media, we had about 26% of people who said they felt lonely, and that increased to 39% afterwards. People are far less likely to meet with their friends. The indicators of depression in general increased over the course of a decade. Eighth graders on social media showed increased risk of depression. And girls are more affected, more vulnerable than boys when it comes to the effects of social media. And there was this one thing that Jonathan Haidt, I believe, was who was referenced, but who talked about this network effect. And the network effect means that once you're off social media, it affects the way that you behave out in the real world. The way that your psychology is damaged by social media, you'll export that to the real world. Kids become more self-obsessed and all sorts of other additional psychological damage is, is done as a result of social media. And then when they try to interact with people in the real world, it's exported there. The suicide rate jumped dramatically 56% leading up to 2017. So this is just after, you know, the release of the first smartphones and getting to 2017. There was a 56% jump in suicide rates. And it's disproportionately in girls. Historically, it was mostly boys who disproportionately engaged in suicidal behavior. But girls, the gap narrowed, at least, between girls and boys after the introduction and pronounced use of social media. There are some who state that internet addiction should be considered its own condition, medical condition. And then everybody has experienced this targeted ads thing. And I swear it has happened so many times when I have been texting somebody about something and then I'll get a targeted ad that's directly related to something I've been texting about. And I have a, I have an iPhone. I'm not sure if that is legal or that's what's supposed to happen, but that would mean they would have to pay some kind of attention to your individual texts, which is terrifying. But whatever the case, there was this one woman who she had a miscarriage and then she kept getting targeted ads related to babies. So it was just kept re-aggravating her emotional injury because she had just miscarried and she just kept getting these ads about babies. So she tried to search miscarriage, miscarriage, miscarriage over and over again, try to get stopped doing that, try to understand in some way. But what they end up doing, these algorithms, they amplify preference. They do this digital herding of people to make it easier to profit off of you. And Facebook initially, they they talked about how they wanted to diversify the things that people were exposed to. But the reality is the the algorithms force sameness. They want to show you the things that they know are more likely to get you engaged. And that also means that the most obnoxious or emotionally driven posts are the ones that are more likely to foster engagement. So they're more likely to show those to you. Each moral and emotional word garnered more engagement by 20%. So you could just have a 20% increase on your engagement, which can mean more ad revenue if you amplify things with more moral and emotional language. 
And then the introduction of autoplay, you know, on YouTube, it was responsible for apparently 70% of views. So it's just leaving it going. So you just keep watching the things that are being suggested to you, keeps you engaged in it. And it was about 70% of views. And adding to that, that the people who are more using more moral and emotional word choices, those are ones to more likely engage you more. So those are the ones more likely to be suggested. But this is all built around neural networks now, and people eventually grew tired of the same thing. So you have a new algorithm that was called Reinforced, and I think this is at Facebook, might have been at Google, but it's called Reinforced. And it found adjacent similarities with videos that people would not necessarily be able to identify. And so one of the effects of this, this is, means that it would find, it would know that you like certain types of videos and it would find some kind of, something analogous to it and suggest it to you. But one thing that resulted from this was that pedophiles would end up being suggested videos of children who were partially clothed. So the algorithm would figure out that people who were on YouTube or something like that would be interested in videos, you know, about children and then would go across the platforms and see what else they're interested in. And therefore it would figure out that, oh, well, they'll probably like videos wherein children are partially clothed and they would send them to the to these pedophiles. And then these would often have links to social media accounts and then the pedophiles would use those to talk to the children. I mean, this is, this is the kind of absolute insanity where you're the only thing that you're trying to look at is trying to get as much engagement as possible. And there's obviously been a problem historically if you were talking to somebody face to face. There are all sorts of things that humanize the other person. You know, there are lots of complexities about them and the ways that they respond to things and all that that would likely dull a lot of the things that you would otherwise feel related to them. But when you don't lay your eyes on your interlocutor, then that has a different effect. And as outrage became the norm on, on social platforms, then people started taking that to the real world. You know, just like we talked about the network effect. So when you're constantly perpetually outraged on social networks, then you export that to everywhere else. So the social media then led to more divided people and it stoked perpetual anger. But the corporate liberalism taught everybody that the only thing that mattered was celebration of individual choice. So it was perfectly fine. It's not family, it's not friends, it's not church, not local community. It's just uh, the matter of your personal choice. And we can see the effects of that, obviously, in the modern political landscape. <laughs> So that's going to do it for part one. We still have a lot to go over related to this. Like I said, very short book. Did not take long to read. And yet there was so much that I needed to pull out from it that I thought was very important to, to bring up to you guys. So for purposes of our analysis, you know, obviously let me know what you think. If you guys have read this, let me know what you think about it. But for analysis purposes, I thought this was, again, it was surprisingly useful. There was a lot in here that was actually more thoughtful and well-sourced and smart and all that than I thought there, there might be from a politician. And it's an extremely important topic. You know, I think this is one of the things that's driving a myriad of the problems, if not the vast majority of the problems that we're seeing nowadays. It could have so much to do with just social media in general. And most of our problems going forward likely would have a lot to do with the power that they, they gain from being able to do this. So I, I think it was a, it's a well done book. You know, he's a really good communicator. The way he tells stories and kind of structures things, it's really easy to follow. And I can see why he's an effective politician. You know, I've seen a couple of his speeches uh, when he was talking to people, uh, you know, at the Capitol or something like that in a hearing or whatever. And uh, you, can, you can definitely see the, the politician in him, but he's also, like I said, a very effective communicator. So big picture wise, it does seem like we need to fundamentally respond to this in a holistic way. It can't just be one thing here or there. And he offers a bunch of political responses to it. He later, uh, he'll talk about how his family has responded to it. But I really think so much of this is going to start, you know, at the very bottom here because there are interests at work that are trying everything they can to push everything in their favor. And they have to be effectively nullified before we get back into kind of a, a healthy footing related to these things. That has everything to do with social media, with entertainment in general, with the kinds of routines that we have nowadays. You know, this instinct to want to stay home more and spend more time online and digitally and not have families and all those kinds of things are tied to all this. So uh, yeah, there's a lot that we need to be doing when it comes to these things. 
But we have another part, like I said, we have a part two that's coming from this one. So hopefully you'll be there for that. Again, let me know what you thought about this book if you read it. Let me know what you think about the ideas in here, or if there's any empirical fact that you take issue with or thought was especially surprising. But otherwise, that's going to be it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening to this thing, and I will see you on the next one. All right, bye. (laughs) 